So thank you so much for the invitation. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and um, yeah, to talk to you about AI art. So first of all, I'm going to show you some slides about the projects I've worked on to show you where um, I come from, because I feel this AI art or the art space in general can be very broad and uh, people come at it from very different angles. So from technology, from media art, from fine art or contemporary art, and everybody has slightly different kind of views on it. Um, yeah, so I started by um, running the Creative AI Meetup in London around, yeah, six years ago now. And uh, it was shortly after Deep Dream came out. And uh, there was, I think, a lot of kind of interest in, uh, in the technology and some of the creative possibilities of GANs and, and so on. And um, yeah, it proved to be quite popular and it led to lots of other opportunities like curating exhibitions in uh, Cambridge Library together with, uh, with the CFI in Cambridge. Um, Impact Festival in the Netherlands, which is uh, a media art festival that looks critically at technology. Uh, to COGEX, which is a business exhibition held in London, and um, they put up some of Mike Tyker's work on easels, which is maybe not quite the way artists typically would display their work, but hey, uh, some business organization thinks that that's the way it should be done. Um, I'm known for organizing the NIRIPS Creativity Workshop, which I did four editions of, and uh, it's actually still going under the leadership of uh, Tom White. And I think they have a submission deadline sometime later this week. So if you have some artwork you want to submit, you should look on the, I think on the NeurIPS website for more details. And yeah, this is the art gallery I did for those four years. And um, yeah, I live uh, in a city called Leicester in the UK, and uh, it's not particularly exciting. So I've tried to work with um, the local university to bring some of the cutting edge AI artists and display their work in public settings, like on this wall and shopping centers and so on. And um, yeah, I've also dabbled a bit with uh, artists working with um, kind of NFTs on the platform called Feral File, which was founded by Casey Rios of Processing Fame. And, um, and yeah, so these are kind of some of my main projects. And now we'll go back to the era of Deep Dream because this marks my entry point in the space and sort of the generation of artists I kind of grew up with and saw their career develop. So yeah, I'm assuming you're all quite um, familiar with Deep Dream and uh, sort of how it works. So uh, yeah, the algorithm looks at the image and it gets really excited and you get all these crazy shapes and colors. And um, even though it's like really old now, I still really like it because to me as a curator, it was an example of an algorithm being creative. So coming out with uh, something kind of really unusual from quite a standard image. But um, I found actually that not too many artists have actually used it that creatively, but Daniel Ambrosi is, uh, is one of these. And um, yeah, he's been working with uh, Deep Dream to kind of make, um, yeah, to give his images a special style. So if you look at the image closely, you can still see the crazy colors and the swirls, but you will also recognize the um, kind of the scene by the lake. And I think those projects to me are kind of more interesting because it's not just about deep dream and its aesthetic. There is also the opportunity to showcase the subject matter too. And yeah, he's also kind of dabbled a bit with making it more cubist. And uh, yeah, then came um, style transfer. 
And for a while, when I was going to all the AI conferences, everybody associated that with uh, AI art. But of course, now, if I mention AI art, it would be DALI, Midjourney, or some of these text -to image generators. And um, at that point in time, I remember going to one of the talks by Simon Colton from Goldsmiths, who was kind of highlighting the differences between the way technologists and artists perceived art. So many labs, I think, were focusing on uh, improving style transfer. So, um, yeah, whereas uh, artists were kind of, artists maybe had different interests. And um, so maybe for some artists, it is kind of fun to double in style transfer, but in some ways, it's like trying to replicate art of the past, whereas artists are trying to innovate and to make something new rather than, you know, copy what, copy what Van Gogh or Monet did back in the past. And so one of the few interesting applications of style transfer to me was kind of broadening the definition of style to like Google Maps or um, calligraphy or something like that. And uh, then came the GAN, which um, I think kind of stayed a focus area for a number of years until it maybe got a bit too realistic. And uh, some of my favorite projects are still the older ones, where, as you can kind of say, or as Ian Goodfellow might say, the GAN still had problems with counting or structure or something like that. Because if you look at those images, you can see that the mouth is in the wrong place. The hair is a bit kind of too wacky. But um, yeah, to me, those images are interesting because they maybe present a new take on the human form. And I think Mario Klingemann has been kind of known for yeah, making a lot of kind of interesting imagery with GANs. And this is some work of his that has said to be similar to uh, Egon Schiller or Francis Bacon. So artists from the first half of the kind of 20th century who kind of, uh, yeah, tried to um, present, yeah, the human form in, uh, yeah, in a very different fashion. And, um, yeah, Scott Eaton is um, yeah is an artist who's also been kind of working with GANs and looking at the human form. And uh, what I like about his work is that um, uh, he uses kind of yeah he's able to create very kind of highly realistic um, textures, but the shapes and the angles are a little bit odd. So it kind of combines the strength of some of the, I think, newer methods or aesthetics to with, with those of the of the older ones. And um, yeah, so I think once GANs became too realistic or too popular, artists were trying to think of what can they do to make their work a little bit more interesting. And um, yeah, Ivona Tau is uh, one of these artists. Um, she's based in Poland, and um, she, let's see if, yeah, so she, I think she, she's been training a neural network to optimize uh, forgetting as opposed to learning, so the process should kind of be going backwards, and um, yeah, I think this is uh, an, an interesting approach. Then... Yeah, Terence Broad has um, has this uh, project which uh, we displayed at, I think, the last in-person Europe's workshop we held, where there are, I think, two neural networks that are trying to um, kind of generate images without any data. So I think it was quite an uncommon approach. And uh, yeah, he's, he's written it up as a paper. It's called Unstable Equilibrium. And um, let's see what's next. And yeah, Jake Elves, he's been um, generating birds and he comes from, uh, yeah, from somewhere with the, with the seaside in the UK. And what I find interesting here as a curator is that um, he generated these birds and he put the screen 
in those kind of Essex marshes. So you can see birds kind of wandering around by the water and uh, there is this kind of generated bird in the middle of them. So um, yeah, that, that is again quite, quite different. And Minna uh, Tairu, uh, so she's an artist who's been looking at um, colonial history and uh, the time when I think the British uh, colonized uh, Benin and uh, there was kind of a gap in cultural production and she tried to kind of imagine what that could look like and these are some of kind of her yeah her efforts and Ben Snell is uh, is an artist who worked with uh, with sculpture and so he looked at uh, the kind of a, a, a vast body of sculptural designs from i think antiquity to modernity then he got his computer to generate this kind of um design and he proceeded he proceeded to destroy the computer and out of the dust of that computer he made the sculpture so it's like a physical object and I thought that was really cool because, yeah, it's it's physical and uh, it's also kind of it recalls some of the artists of the early 20th century who were also kind of destroying their work. And yeah, that was good. And there's another group of artists who are looking a lot at, at the data set and uh, Helena Siren is one of these. And I think she probably has the most distinct aesthetic out of uh, all the kind of AI artists I can think of. And um, in, in those images, so I think in the image on the right, she's combined photography with the newspaper and maybe with some other medium. And kind of through that, the kind of aesthetic has, has become quite quite different and I think she's known also for working with kind of small data sets and in chaining various models and uh, yeah now she's moved on to pottery and uh, that could work uh, quite interestingly too and then Anna Riddler so this is actually a project that I commissioned when I was working on the impact festival in the Netherlands in 2018 and uh, Anna Riddler came over to Utrecht and she bought lots of tulips. Then she proceeded to take 10,000 photographs of those tulips and uh, she categorized them and then kind of printed them out to make this data set and also to train uh, again. And now whenever those works are exhibited, the video is uh, kind of shown together with uh, with the data set so normally you would kind of see this whole wall where there's maybe like a thousand of these tulip photograph photographs kind of uh, stuck stuck onto it and um, i think this way of displaying is quite interesting because typically the efforts of the human are not kind of highlighted so much in a lot of these exhibitions but uh, in anna Riddler's case, it was very important for her to kind of highlight the human labor, particularly in her case, because she made all the data set herself. And uh, yeah, to kind of make a link between uh, the two. And she also worked to make an NFT version of the project called Blumen Veiling where you could buy this NFT of a tulip that would bloom for a week and then it would die because of course real flowers also don't bloom forever and yeah now I'll talk about um, I guess more recent projects and um, yeah I think I, I always feel a little bit weird about the past uh, two years because it seems like there's been such an explosion of interest and a whole new community of artists who exist on Twitter and Discord and on these kind of NFT platforms. So this new community of artists has uh, appeared and uh, yeah, a few things have changed. I guess also we had the pandemic 
uh, which kind of facilitated everybody's kind of interest and activity in the online space as opposed to physical exhibitions. But um, yeah, it also feels to me that uh, with a lot of these kind of recent artworks, the focus has been a bit more kind of uh, commercial uh, as opposed to maybe querying or critiquing the technology or kind of aiming to impress curators and the contemporary art world. But yeah, so there is uh, a video with Memo Acton, which, uh, which is kind of similar to the one I showed you in the beginning with Deep Dream. And uh, this to me is a nice link. It shows kind of what happened over the past five or six years in terms of technological progress. But yeah, this video is like always bad quality. However, I tried to um, record it. But um, yeah, if you look at the uh, images, you can see that it's got some natural um, kind of landscapes and also elements of, I don't know if it's like motherboards or random computer parts that kind of showcase maybe the prevalence of uh, technology and how we all coexist with it. And um, yeah, Vadim Epstein, he's been, I think, quite active in uh, developing some of the tools. And one of these is called Aphantasia. And um, yeah, I quite like it because again, it has a different aesthetic and I think the video is probably going to be horrible quality again, but um, it's called Teorema 1, I think. Um, it's a project he developed for Braindrops Cloud, which is one of these kind of NFT selling platforms. And uh, yeah, it kind of, uh, it kind of, kind of tells this, uh, yeah, narrative uh, that kind of combines technology and science and his views of, of the world. And um, yeah, again, it's uh, it has its, his own kind of distinct aesthetic, which I think sometimes recalls Deep Dream, is kind of, yeah, sometimes goes beyond reality. And what do we have next? Um, Maneki Neko, so, she is an artist uh, that I actually have in a show that I am, that will hopefully eventually go online with uh, a Hong Kong based platform called Screens Guru. And um, yeah, she's been working with, uh, yeah, with Cliff and Dali to generate this kind of image. And uh, again, I think she's tried to figure out what she can do to make a distinct style. And she's made this. I think quite a busy image with uh, kind of lots of different images of flowers and human faces. And um, yeah, I guess she kind of made a collage of, of some of the images that were generated, but it is quite different in aesthetic to a lot of the other work you see. And Botto is a work by uh, Mario Klingerman which he kind of launched sometime last year. And um, so there was this kind of uh, clip based system that was uh, generating images and the community was voting for which images should, um, um, should, should kind of be minted as NFTs and sold. And um, I think in the first few weeks it made over a million dollars. So that was I suppose a nice uh, money maker for Mario and also kind of an opportunity to involve a community. I think it was maybe like 5,000 people in the kind of creation and evaluation of the, of the artworks. And yeah, then came Dali and everything else after it. And um, I met with uh, Anna Riddler, I think shortly after yeah, Dali too uh, kind of came out and I know she was giving access. So she kind of doubled a bit with uh, creating some tulips because of course she kind of had her past data set and the interest and you can see kind of how much more realistic and uh, exciting maybe some of those um, images are. And yeah, Sophia Crespo, uh, she's an artist quite interested in the natural uh, form. So she was kind of using some of these tools to 
kind of uh, imagine things that don't exist, which I always find is kind of a good use case. So this is the zebra and flamingo, kind of two variations, one which is more zebra and one which is more flamingo. And um, yeah, another way to, for me to kind of to make interesting work with these tools is to maybe highlight some of the kind of problems or the limitations and um, yeah, I, I remember somebody, I think it was Julian Tegelia, started a, a Twitter thread kind of for people to also show the kind of failed examples of generations and not just the successes. And I found kind of this image with the, all the failed hands. And I thought some of these are quite, quite interesting, like the one in the top corner with, I don't know how many fingers. And Oh, yeah, this is working. Yeah, so this is a work from Jake Elves. And uh, yeah, as you may kind of realize, it's uh, it's a bit older than, uh, th than what is happening now. But um, yeah, he made this work called Closed Loop with two neural networks. So one was generating images in response to text. And the other one was uh, generating text in response to the image. And in some ways, you could say that they were having a conversation. And uh, yeah, to me, this is still quite uh, an interesting project. And I think I would love it if somebody did something similar now to kind of uh, showcase maybe how technology has moved on and to see how different this type of convers conversation could be. Because I know certainly with, with Jake's work at a certain point, I don't know if it was like a blue sofa or there was kind of a certain image where once it appeared, the kind of uh, the, the diversity in image generation would, would completely stop. So, um, yeah, it's a cool project. And yeah, I've got yeah a couple of, um, I guess, modern um, artworks that I've, yeah, because I've, I've been trying to update my, my slides with some works that are reasonably recent. And um, I struggled to find something from this, kind of huge landscape of uh, Dali mid journey and stable diffusion work that's kind of been happening on Twitter. And um, yeah, here are some examples of artists who maybe make work that is, uh, yeah, aesthetically beautiful. And one of these is from Claire Silva. And um, I think she's been quite prolific with these text to image generation systems also kind of very active on Twitter. And um, yeah, I think she's combined various tools to make uh, this work. And Bas Utterweg or uh, Ganbrood has also been kind of making work that or that, that is kind of, uh, yeah, quite detailed. And here, like the subject matter is, uh, is quite confusing in, in many respects. And uh, um, yeah, again, quite distinct from uh, lots of other work. And some artists make work that maybe has the aesthetic of watercolor. So this is somebody who goes by the name of NFT Unity. And yeah, some more work by Bas Utterweg, uh, which, uh, yeah, which is again, quite beautiful. And um, yeah, you might have uh, seen this. So Jason Allen is a photographer, or I don't think he's a photographer actually. So he is somebody who used, um, yeah, one of these text to image generation tools to make this uh, image and send it to the Colorado State Fair where it got the first prize. And um, I know there was, um, kind of, uh, yeah, some discussion about it on Twitter because not everybody was uh, sure as to kind of what uh, what extent it was clear to the judges the role of the tools and how much the artists kind of relied on AI. And uh, yeah, also to me as a curator and I think to some of the other kind of AI art community members, 
the image looks quite generic. It's similar to a lot of other work that's uh, being produced. So in some ways it would have been interesting if maybe it was a work that was uh, kind of higher quality that would have um, got the first place. Um, and yeah, some niche art communities are kind of also banning AI generated images. And I think there's kind of uh, seems to be, um, yeah, I guess here, as they put it, a wider art ethics um, debate between kind of these recent AI art uh, practitioners who develop very kind of uh, complex prompts to generate very beautiful artworks. And then it kind of turns out that um, yeah, that work is so good so that all these kind of illustrators or graphic designers are almost kind of uh, out of work. And it's kind of their work that has been feeding a lot of these systems. So it will be kind of uh, interesting to see how it uh, plays out and uh, if there'll be kind of more discussions regarding plagiarism or kind of improving the kind of the rights of all these kind of illustrators and artists who have contributed to the data set without, let's say, explicitly giving their permission. Um, but yeah. And now I think for the rest of the presentation, I'll talk about some artworks that are maybe a bit more kind of loosely related to AI or at least are less generative and rely more on kind of other AI systems. And I'll start off with uh, Scott Kelly and Ben Porkinhorn, who made those, who made this project called Signs of the Times, and they put these billboards up in a national park, then in front of a slide, to highlight how recommender systems kind of influence our day-to-day um, -day lives and uh, kind of our reliance also on technology, how it really stops us from enjoying life, right? Because you can't really even go down the slide anymore without kind of knocking your head into the sign. And um, Gretchen Andrew um, calls herself an, a search engine artist or an internet imperialist. And um, she's been making various uh, kind of analog works. Like here, you can see that this, there's this kind of image of uh, flowers. And uh, what is interesting about her work is that um, she is really good at search engine optimization. And um, she finds a narrow kind of search term. And uh, then she makes kind of work in, in response to that term. And uh, if you kind of Google that in quotation marks, then uh, in theory, her works would come up as, as the top results in, um, in, in, in the image section. And I think she's got um, a series of pieces. So this one is called Contemporary Art Auction Record. And she's got another one called Cover of Art Forum. And uh, these are, I think, quite interesting ways of her kind of, uh, I guess, hacking the SEO system and then also kind of uh, adding more kind of data to, um, yeah, to that system. And uh, this is one of my uh, favorite works. It's by Shang Sunbak Kim Yang Hong, two artists based in Seoul and um, they worked with portrait painters and a facial recognition system. And these portrait painters had to paint portraits with a facial recognition system. And as soon as the facial recognition system detected a face, they had to change what they were doing so that in the final work, it would not be seen as a face by the system. And these are some of their results. So some of these are kind of more easily understandable as a portrait than others. And uh, if, for example, if you look at the image on the left, I think it took me actually quite a long time to figure out where there was a face in there. And then I realized that if you look kind of horizontally, I mean, basically the face is horizontal as opposed to vertical, and it's kind of replicated a couple of times. And uh, yeah, to me, that's quite an interesting way of depicting a face. And um, yeah, it's a way of how these systems can sort of help stimulate the creativity and find a new way of 
kind of working with the limitations you're given to produce something that you might not have done otherwise. And um, Martin Mariansky worked with the curve uh, generator to also come up with these faces. And um, I think in the last um, AI art online gallery I did, so with the Nerves Creativity Workshop, this was the artwork that gained the most attention on Twitter. So none of the style gam projects or anything like that. It was kind of this work because it was using, I think, some quite different uh, techniques and uh, yeah, very different um, perspective that yeah got the most attention. And um, yeah, adversarial Mona Lisa. Um, yeah, so I was uh, looking for yeah new projects to add before my talk, and I came across this which is actually done, I think, by a startup. And I couldn't actually find much more information about it, which is a shame because I thought it was quite a cool project. So I think they have um, on, um, on OpenSea or on one of these NFT platforms, they've got a collection of uh, 100 images of Mona Lisa. Uh, I think you can probably find them if you Google adversarial Mona Lisa. And like from a distance, they all look like Mona Lisa. But I think if you like click on it, occasionally you can see that the kind of the face has been tweaked a little bit, but still you would recognize it as a Mona Lisa and not um, Johnny Depp. But yeah, I think that was quite an interesting play with these uh, facial recognition systems. And Tom White, you might have uh, seen his work uh, perception engines so the image on the left is supposed to be a starfish and uh, it's supposed to be kind of um, the the best depiction of a starfish to be recognized by all the image recognition systems and um yeah of course if i was trying to draw a starfish to show you guys i'd probably kind of uh, do something completely different where all the legs of the fish would be kind of uh, like sticking out. But of course, machine perception is is different. And this, these works highlight some of the similarities and differences. And uh, Kirill Benzi, oops, wait, I thought this was a video. Um, but maybe I forgot to put the video part in. But um, yeah, so Kirill Benzi made this work. And um, if you look at the two sides, there are various categories like guinea pig, traffic light, cabbage, butterfly, bell pepper, um, and, and so on. And uh, so kind of uh, data from those categories uh, make up kind of this, this flower, I think, kind of. Um, yeah, in the way it's kind of been been trained and, and generated. And it's called These Are Not Flowers, because even though they look like flowers, actually, um, I think in different points in time, it's like different categories. And um, Nuf uh, Algervasia has uh, also made a work that's, I think, quite distinct from what what you might see. And um, so she's originally from... Uh, I think Saudi Arabia, and uh, she was interested in um, kind of the history of her country and uh, kind of particularly what happened uh, kind of during the colonialism era. And uh, she found that a lot of the depictions were made by the colonizers as opposed to kind of the local um, community. And so she used one of these um, tools um, to kind of erase parts of the image that were from the colonial gaze and uh, to leave behind just kind of the images um, left um, by the kind of by, by the original community. And yeah, Harm van den Dorpel um, also uses something that's a bit, let's see if I have a video that will play here. Yes, maybe, oh no, it won't. Something else is playing. So he had, ah, okay. I think maybe it's playing now. 
So there are various kind of turtle drawings that um, he was generating on a website called Hybrid Bio. And uh, so there was kind of an evolutionary system. And uh, I think as a viewer, you could uh, click on uh, two of those works to kind of make them parents. And then they would generate lots of kind of children and kind of the process would be repeated until they would all converge into an artwork that was kind of very similar. And um, yeah, that would be called the Supreme artwork and it would then be printed and made into a physical work. So again, I think, um, yeah, this work is quite cool because in this kind of uh, flood of, uh, I think, deep learning based tools, this artist was using some kind of very different methods and um, techniques to, um, yeah, to generate a work which is, I think, yeah, aesthetically quite different and also kind of becomes really part of the process of creating a work that, yeah, is then kind of printed and uh, made, made analog. And um, yeah, Lauren Lee McCarthy is, um, is an artist who's been interested in uh, working with, um, um, yeah, in, in looking, I guess, how these technologies affect the, the, our, our daily life. And um, in, a pro in this project called Lauren, she wanted to analyze the way kind of Alexa or Google Home has uh, an impact in our kind of day-to-day -day life. And she decided to try and replace those systems with herself. So she was, I think, given like, control of the temperature, the lights, and some of these other tools um, that are quite typical um, and that are influenced by these systems. And um, yeah, she was doing all that herself manually to kind of um, highlight how intrusive some of these systems can be and also some of the roles that they kind of take over from, uh, from humans. And yeah, this project seems to have caused some uh, interest on uh, yeah, Twitter recently. So it's by Dries de Porter who is an artist who is, uh, I think, quite talented in making attention-grabbing work. So at one point, he had an app called Die With Me that I think you could download. And I think if you had, um, you could only use it if you had less than 10% of battery or something. And I remember it was always, it was top of a lot of these download charts for a while because I guess it was quite, quite fun. And, um, now he's got this project, I think it's called a follower or something like that. And um, so the concept is, um, is this. Um, it kind of, uh, it gathers, I think, data from, uh, from open cameras to figure out how and where an image uh, from Instagram was taken. And he's got like a few different kind of examples of that. And uh, I think it is quite, I guess, scary in some ways. And yeah, given the reaction on Twitter, it kind of, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, highlights some of the issues with, with surveillance. And of course, this has been an area of interest of artists for a long time. And uh, yeah, I think this was how many, this is probably five or seven years ago, Adam Harvey was making kind of uh, facial, um, markers and uh, crazy hairstyles to evade um, yeah, facial recognition. Then I think it proceeded to the project called Hyperface, which uh, merged the texture, I think, of the, of the face with the background. And then there are designers like Eva Novak that made jewelry to kind of, again, uh, hide the face and others uh, projected a different face uh, onto your own so that again you would not be recognized and what's next and uh yeah some others made t-shirts that would kind of um yeah help you evade recognition so i think these are probably all my slides um 
Yeah, I hope you kind of uh, enjoyed the variety of examples. And um, I guess if now you you are kind of looking to make um, AI art and are dabbling with, uh, I think, DALI or Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion. Um, yeah, I would say that for me as a curator, it would be interesting to see more works that uh, spend more time maybe looking at the technology critically or thinking about how they could be part of a broader process. So maybe you generated an image, um, like could you do something that's like different? Could you maybe make something like analog or physical out of it? Could you highlight the limitations or the problems with technology? And um, yeah, I think I will probably end here. And I believe there is some time for, for questions.